En we zijn weer terug vanuit de Kromordhallen in Amsterdam, waar we de hele dag uitzenden vanaf de Emers ID. We hebben belangrijke gasten die op het podium hebben gestaan. We hebben mensen van Deloitte, we hebben mensen die hier rondlopen aan tafel. Uh, we zijn hier de hele dag en uh, mocht je een programma gemist hebben, dan kun je dat altijd weer terugkijken via YouTube. Uh, gaan we door naar onze volgende gast. What is your name and what do you do? Hi, I'm Nell Watson. I'm faculty of AI and Robotics at Singularity University. I'm also co-founder of Quantacore, which is a body measurement solution, and also openeth.org, which is aiming to crowdsource the space of ethics for humans and machines. That's a lot. Could we start with the last one, because that sounds very interesting. What, what, what is <laughs> open ethics? Yeah, uh, openeth.org, uh, open ETH, is, uh, well, we're attempting to make ethics computable so that they can be interpreted and understood by machines and you can make eth ethical calculations about things. And so we are attempting to teach ethics to machines in kind of a similar way to how we teach children. Now, when we are young children, uh, sitting by our grandparents' knees, uh, we get taught stories about the big bad wolf and three little pigs and things like that. And within those stories are encoded ideas about morality or about how the world works. And we're attempting to do something a little bit similar by specifying scenarios in the world and then different variations which are more or less preferable. And by mapping these kinds of situations uh, and with a little bit of machine learning in the mix um, to generate solutions for things we don't necessarily have covered yet, we believe that we can help teach morality to machines so that machines can make moral decisions and understanding about the world. And how far are you? It's very much a prototype at the moment, but we do have um, a uh, engine with an algorithm behind it. All of the code is open and you can go on the website and you can help to create these ethical scenarios and help to specify them today. Right. So b before you can create an, uh, uh, an ethical solution or, or program uh, ethics, you have to know what ethics are and whether they are uh, a global thing or uh, whether there are regional differences. Uh, uh, you probably studied that? Absolutely. I mean, we're not trying to prescribe some sort of universal best. Of course, that's not going to work for different cultures, for different periods in time, for different nuances of situations. We're trying to find answers, though, for something I call kindergarten ethics, right? These are the things that ideally you've learned by the age of six. Don't steal, don't hit people, um, don't tell lies. If we can nail the basics that almost every culture and almost every reasonable person in the world would not object to, if we can boil it down to those fundamentals, we can cover about 90% of ethical interactions right there. Really? Because I think that one of the things that children already understand as well is that sometimes it is good to lie, because sometimes you need to lie. Of course. So how, how do you deal with that? Well, one of the nice things we can do is we can specify things which are never to be broken, such as running around murdering people, um, and then things which are conditionable, right? Things which are a little bit um, variable, right? Just as how we treat our children and how we treat our pets changes their personalities as they grow up. You know, we can have a, a mean dog or a happy dog, depending on how we treat it. I think we can do something similar with machine intelligence. How we interact with it and condition it will change um, how it expresses in terms of a personality, if you will. And I think that that will suit different people who have different needs or different desires from their interactions with machines. Right. Now you're already talking about interaction with machines that is not really happening right now or, 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 or not that much yet, but, but it is something that you see happening in, in the near future? Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things that people keep coming back to is stuff like uh, self-driving cars, you know, should you run down the grandmother or the, the kid in the baby carriage or something like that. I think those are quite silly because you know, as, as a human, you could do anything in that situation and nobody would, would put you in a court necessarily, no, you know. No, because it's called an accident. It's an yeah, accident. Yeah. So no, nobody could do anything about it. Exactly. So, you know, 
whatever happens, happens. Um, and any decision you would make in a split second, you couldn't be held accountable for. So I think those are a little bit, um, a little bit silly in a sense. But uh, what I think is more pertinent is stuff like, today we have intelligent assistants that are doing things like scheduling meetings for us, right? We have these today, these AIs that can respond to emails automatically and stuff like that. But what if somebody asks you for a meeting and you're not really that interested and you say, oh, I'm terribly sorry, my schedule's booked up for two weeks. Uh, and the intelligent assistant says, oh, but you're completely free on Friday. And you're like, shut up, you know? I think, I think these are more real world problems which we are facing today and we're going to face much more in the near future as machines have increasing um, responsibilities for doing things like pro procuring or organizing our lives and our meetings and how we meet up with friends and things like that. So this is why ethics is needed today. This is why ethics is needed, but could, could you elaborate a little bit more about how we are going to interact with machines and what kind of machines and what kind of situations and, 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 and when this is going to happen? I mean, Yeah, I think I think uh, it's been very interesting to watch the evolution of companies like Amazon, which have nailed logistics to such a degree. You know, 45% of the population in the mainland US is now within 20 miles of uh, Amazon Depot. And of course, they basically created, in many ways, the, the cloud revolution in enabling other people to build upon their own platform technologies. But recently they've brought out things like Alexa, right? A bot that you can talk to and that can guide you to certain purchases right. if, if, if you are looking for something. I think it's, it's, it's a truth, uh, an axiom, if you will, that whoever is closest to the consumer will tend to control the conversation. And today and in the near future, this is likely to be bots. This is likely to be uh, these intelligent assistants that help us to make decisions, right? If you're looking for a scarf on, uh, on, online, there are thousands and thousands of scarves to choose from. I think curating those choices is a massive problem. And it's one of the reasons why machines are going to have increasing responsibilities in the years to come. Years to come is in like the next decade or? Uh, less, uh, today and, and going forward. Right, and then they do curating. I, I think a real intelligent machine would not even curate, but I would just have the scarf hanging uh, uh, there when I need it. Precisely, that, that is where we're heading to. It's something called anticipatory design, where basically an experience happens that is just magically brought into existence and you don't even need to think about it. Right. You know. In the old days, very rich people had butlers and generals had aide-de-camps and things like this that so would just choose the right wine at the right moment and so on and so forth, right? Yeah, you would only miss them when they're not there. Precisely. Um, and this is where we're heading now. But uh, instead of being for the super rich, it's now going to be for everyone. So just as your Nest thermostat will today automatically decide what is going to be most comfortable for you, it doesn't ask you whether you want it hotter or cooler, and your Spotify playlist will tell you, uh, it will play music that it has a good guess that you are going to appreciate or enjoy. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to ask you what your favorite artists are. I think these kinds of anticipatory design for experiences are going to be increasingly part of our lives. And it's one of the reasons why we're going to adopt these kinds of intelligent assistants very quickly. Because these kinds of magical experiences, we're going to want a lot of them in our lives that I think but on the other hand what you also see is, is a lot of people are annoyed by the fact that Facebook is deciding uh, uh, what is in, uh, interesting for you and uh, and what you should watch and more and more people are experiencing the feeling um, or the idea that they are um, that Facebook is limiting their views on the world because uh, and, and then they, and they can't control it and they don't know why certain things are withheld from them and, and, and why certain things are shown um, true that, that that is that is a fair point I think um, I think we do need more accountable algorithms. Um, there's, there's a new phrase called open execution. It's this idea of understanding how an algorithm did something 
right. and why and for whom right. and using which premises. The trouble is that with a lot of deep learning techniques, it's actually very difficult to figure out what happened. Uh, it's kind of a black box. Uh, info goes in, interesting results come out, which are often eerily accurate, um, but often have biases in there, and we're not quite sure where they came from. So one of the biggest areas in research at the moment is trying to figure out, uh, trying to get better ways of like taking a peek inside the box and seeing what's going on. Okay. Right. Now these are all very hardcore technologies and uh, uh, and things that are already well they're worked on, but are not very visible in society yet. Is, is is there any other kind of trends that you're monitoring that you see here happening right now, uh, um, walking around here maybe, or have seen uh, in other uh, venues or situations? Well, you raise an interesting point in that a lot of technologies that are truly intelligent don't look so right. Um, a, a lot of the, the best machine learning technology goes into simple things like deciding uh, your calendar schedule in a better way, like, like whether it would be better to book uh, a visit to the gym at Friday at 4 p.m. or Saturday at 2 p.m., these kinds of simple things. Whenever you uh, look at your holiday snaps, your photo editor system can automatically create a lovely video and picture right. collage and that is using incredibly powerful technology but we don't think of it as being intelligent we don't think of it as being AI right until it is invented it's like magic spooky future AI and as soon as we have it in our pocket it's just a tool and we forget about just right. how intelligent it is right so uh, so that will be a real trend everything is just moving towards uh, uh, and well, to the background Absolutely. So yeah. we're going to see a ubiquity of in, uh, artificial intelligence guiding every single aspect of our lives, Incre you know, increasingly the most mundane, boring things that uh, seem almost pointless to optimize. When you have an abundance of these optimizations, then you can have more magical, spontaneous experiences happen. All right. That's a cute closing words. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Jullie weer bedankt voor het kijken. We zijn hier de hele dag live vanuit de Kommerdwallenhallen uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, waar wij uitzenden voor de e-mers. ID, je kunt ons live volgen via Facebook en uh, via de website. En uiteraard kun je alles on terugkijken uh, op YouTube.